pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay, we'll start off with presentations by the public on matters not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the commission. I don't have any requests to speak. So we'll go on to correspondence and staff communications from our planning commission secretary. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, briefly, we have a, there should be two memos in front of you um, this evening. Um, an item from Sandra Wright um, regarding item number three, which is the Myers Ranch tentative map. And then also a, um, a memo from myself um, regarding item number four, which is the retail firearms and ammunition sales. And um, speaking of that particular item, we would request um, that the Planning Commission take that item up um, first tonight after you take action on the minutes, uh, since we have our uh, Lieutenant Delaney with us this evening. Okay. Um, could I have any disclosure of ex parte communications? Any commissioners? Okay. Um, a pr consideration and approval of the minutes from the June 5th meeting. Will we approve the minutes? <clears throat> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. So we will go on to our item number four, the public hearing on the retail firearms and ammunition sales. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Perez. I will uh, present this item. Um, tonight we're act asking for your um, consideration of a resolution uh, which would recommend the City Council adopt an ordinance that would make changes to Title 17 of our Municipal Code, which is the zoning section pertaining to retail sales of firearms and ammunition. Uh, we have brought this item before your commission uh, during the last uh, few meetings, um, going over different uh, concepts as, after this matter was brought to our attention a few months ago um, regarding some ambiguities in our municipal code as it pertains to um, retail sales of firearms and ammunition. So tonight we are back um, in requesting that you conduct a public hearing to consider the proposed um, zoning ordinance changes that are in front of you. Uh, we're proposing a, a minor definition just for consistent definition amendment just for minor uh, clarification to make sure we're using consistent um, terminology. But most critically, uh, which is uh, on the last page of your staff report, uh, we are proposing to change those zones by which uh, retail sales of firearms and ammunition uh, would be um, allowed. So in this particular case, uh, we are proposing that they would become a conditional use in our business park, limited industrial, light industrial, and heavy industrial zones, and take them out of our uh, community commercial, central business district, waterfront, and mixed use zones. Uh, this is a, similar to what we have presented to your commission um, previously. And um, this is a matter that we have worked on closely with the city's police department. And uh, Lieutenant Delaney from the police department is here tonight and can offer um, his input on behalf of the police department. Uh, so the substance of the changes are that, um, that the zoning matrix changes. So tonight uh, we would seek your approval of this resolution and then move that we would move this item on to the city council after that. So this time I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Does the commission have any questions for Mr. Tilly, thank you for your, for your presentation. Um, I will go ahead and open the public hearing. Would um, Lieutenant Delaney like to come up first? Um, the police, I've spoken with, uh, I wasn't a party to the, um, the original meetings in regards to this amendment, but um, I've spoken with Deputy Chief Stevens and Lieutenant Gerlot who were, and we um, are in agreement with uh, this zoning change, and we don't have any, any problems with it at all from a public safety perspective. Okay. Does the commission have any questions? I, I guess my question is, why would you care where a gun store is located at all within our city? I mean, from residential, but downtown, if Cabela's said they wanted to build down here, why would you care? 
Yeah, from a public safety perspective, it, you know, we don't, unless the area, unless they were going to put a, a firearm store into, say, a high crime area that had a lot of problems with burglaries or something like that, maybe, or there was some chance where the weapons could be diverted into the community or something like that, then, of course, that would be a public safety act. But other than that, no, it wouldn't be the police department's place to really monitor where the city establishes, uh, you know, just generally speaking, where they yeah, establish I mean, kind I, of businesses. I was just trying to figure out, I mean, do we hear of a lot of gun stores that get robbed and stuff? Um, I don't have a lot of experience with a lot of gun stores getting robbed. Typically, the mm. uh, the owners are heavily armed. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> so it, does, it doesn't happen with a great deal of frequency. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, it does happen. But. I, I'm sure that it's happened somewhere in the world. But I mean, sure. I, I was just going, doesn't the, the person running the store be more of a criteria than where the store is? So, you know, maybe you wouldn't have your guns with, you know, some part of them not connected up so it wouldn't work, or you wouldn't have thousands of rounds of ammunition laying out on a table. You may have a box and the rest of it's in storage. Isn't, isn't that more of the criteria to a gun store to yeah, use well, the operator more than the location? Um, yeah, I mean, other than what I kind of, the high crime area potential for right. the problem of you know people getting robbed going to their car for their firearms and that sort of thing. But typically, yes, and the, there is a lot of uh, rules and regulations from the, um, alcohol, the federal alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and as well as the California Department of Justice. So there's, there's quite a lot of stringent rules on people that sell uh, firearms. Oh, there's even rules from them, too. Yes. Yeah, oh, the federal, okay. state, and then, we, of course, we have our local ordinances as well. Um, one of the things that we do like about the proposal is the idea that it's a conditional use. So there is, um, there is an ability for the city to consider the Absolutely. applicants. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Delaney. Yes, ma'am. I have two requests to speak. The first one is uh, Brent Dawson. Uh, good evening, Chair Perez and Commission members. My name is Brent Dawson. I'm the owner of American Tactical Outfitters. I'm a resident of West Sacramento, first moving to the city in 2005 after returning from military service in Afghanistan. Until February of this year, I operated my business in West Sacramento for the last three years under the firearms broker concept. Uh, towards the end of 2013, I began moving forward with the intention of expanding my business into a larger retail location. Part of my business model was to introduce retail sales of firearms as an accessory use as defined by the current definition. I have no intention of opening additional gun store at this time. I will say it's been a rather challenging process with first obtaining answers to what I would call a convoluted definition of the current zoning regulations as they pertain to firearm sales, whether a broker, a full retail, or as an accessory use. Another challenge has been if to find a suitable location under the current matrix, which will be acceptable for all parties involved. As a disabled veteran-owned small business, my working capital is not always at a level I wish it could be. And therefore, I choose to make financially sound decisions rather than throwing hard-earned money at lost causes. I'd rather do so once the right way and not skirt around existing regulations with the hope no one will care. I made numerous inquiries to various departments regarding the previous mentioned zoning regulations. I was contacted by Charlene Hamilton and David Tilley and opened a dialogue. I've had the opportunity to discuss my concerns, challenges, and other various topics related to firearm sales within the city of West Sacramento. Their involvement has been greatly appreciated. As a result of my dialogue, Ms. Hamilton and Mr. Tilley, uh, with Mr. Uh, Ms. Hamilton and Mr. Tilley, I discussed several proposed locations, one being in the Central Business District. As mentioned in the staff report, numerous concerns were raised with this location. Again, as mentioned in the staff report, I inquired as to another business, Ammunition. My primary concern was a perceived disparity. This business appears to be operating freely as a retail gun store in an unpermitted zone while my attempts to establish a legitimate business in a permitted zone have met with some resistance. Each of the least, last three staff reports have stated staff is looking into their operations for compliance. So I ask uh, the question, are they in compliance? I've also reached out to former police chief Drummond last year before his retirement and had a few informal discussions with him regarding retail sales of firearms in the city. I've attempted to address the current administration and attended a joint meeting on April 10th. The police department I had to cancel at the last moment and no follow-up was made um, or scheduled. At the request of Ms. Hamilton, I provided numerous recommendations cited from other municipalities such as alarm, security, insurance requirements. The only feedback thus far 
uh, from the police department has been the cited distance recommendation. Uh, whether it's store security protocols, backgrounds, or licensing requirements, both the state of California and federal government regulate all aspects of firearm storage, accountability, and sales. It is the one of the most restrictive and well-regulated industries in the United States, especially in California. Uh, to sum it up, I think the reason why we're all here today is to discuss more suitable locations within the city. I believe the proposed resolution does so, and I support it. I want to thank Mr. Tilley and the commissions for their assistance and efforts regarding this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Garrett. Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, my name is Ken Garrett. I am the owner of Ammunition, All Phase Security, and GFC, the building in which both are housed. I um, have a business license, retail sales, firearms, but um, it's, it may be, maybe not in compliance. Uh, I talked with Mr. Tilly this week, advised him that if we weren't in compliance, that we were willing to um, take steps necessary now or when license renews. Um, I'm not exactly sure why we're not in compliance, but if, uh, if, if that's the case, then that's not a problem for us to get that done. Ex license expires in two months. Uh, we can jump on it right now or we can jump on it later. Um, with respect to the uh, changes being proposed for licensing in West Sacramento, I'm good with what I've seen. So uh, I'm not opposed to uh, no firearm stores in the business district. I've looked at the map that Mr. Tilly provided and I'm happy with that. So all good on my end as far as that goes. And I guess the rest of it will work out. Can I ask Mr. Garrett a question? Sure. Uh, Mr. Garrett, thank you. Thank you for coming today. Um, I, I did have one question I was going to ask staff, but since you're here, um, Ammunition and All Face Security, are those two separate companies? They are. They are two separate companies. Okay. That was it. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Garrett? Thank you, Mr. Garrett. I don't have any other requests to speak, so I will close the public hearing and I will look to my commissioners. Are there any questions for staff? I do have just, just a comment. I, I, I want to thank the, the two business owners, um, Mr. Dawson and Mr. Garrett, for coming and, and uh, addressing the commission today. Uh, what I heard particularly was that um, it sounded like you had a really positive experience working with city staff. Uh, you know, given the parameters of, of, of what you're dealing with. Um, and so I appreciate that. I want to acknowledge staff for their hard work. Um, and I do appreciate also um, Lieutenant uh, Delaney's time for coming out um, and, and really helping us um, use our planning and zoning to further and protect public safety. So thank you for that. Um, so it sounds to me that um, from what I've heard uh, that, that the, the two people who spoke during the public hearing are um, supportive of staff recommendation. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add, but I'll make a motion to approve uh, staff recommendation unless other people want to contribute. Feel free to jump I'll, in. I'll pause if anybody has any comments that they want to ask. I have a question okay. before I second, so. Okay, sorry, if we can come back to a motion. Um, it's actually more of a, of a um, comment for, for staff. And it has to do with the reference to ammunition, again, in the staff report. Um, and Mr. Garrett answered my question that they are separate businesses. So I, I do have a hard time seeing the firearms and ammunition sales as an accessory use. If um, I know we've been tiptoeing around the accessory use issue. And if whether or not they're in compliance with that, um, I have a hard time seeing it as an accessory use given, especially with uh, the ad that's in even our local paper today, the primary use seems to be firearm sales, ammunition sales, and then training. Um, so if that helps with your uh, internal discussions of whether or not they're in compliance with their permit, and then moving forward, maybe uh, we can get them into this permitting process and have them be uh, 
in compliance. Thank you. Otherwise, I actually like this as, as written. Thank you. Commissioner Olson. Yeah, as a whole, I, I agree with the way this was written. Um, the piece that I'm kind of skeptical about is that there's no there's no uh, zoning designation here where it's not unconditional. And while that seems like it might be a good thing, if a Cabela's or a larger retailer were looking to site uh, a, a, a facility in our town, I'm afraid that they would look at this and they would get the wrong idea. That this is completely conditional and, you know, possibly they would they would move somewhere else and take their sales tax revenue and that sort of thing with us well this would not make their entire operation you know conditional per se it would be it would, you know they could proceed with their facility um, we would need we under this provision we would do a use permit for the firearm sales aspect of their facility but would not be for their entire facility and so even now as things are written um, where they would most likely go, they would need a use permit for firearm sales um, anyway. And so in this, in this particular case, uh, we are trying to remain somewhat consistent with what we have here, but make some adjustments ge more geographically. And um, if you can see the map that I, I provided to you in a memo uh, this evening, there's you know, quite a large area of the community where um, this would still be permitted, albeit on a conditional basis. Okay. I just wanted to share that. <clears throat> Commissioner Moore. Thank you. David, I guess my, my only question is on ammunition. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we, you know, we've been doing this for three months or two months, whatever it's been. I would have thought by now, if he was not fully in compliance, we would have been working on this. Yeah, well, we, I am aware of some of the particulars with, you know, ammunition. Uh, did speak, had a good conversation with Mr. Garrett uh, yesterday, I believe it was. Um, part of what we're doing here is a means to, um, you know, they can, this is a path, if these trades ultimately approved by the city council, it does give them a path by which they can become a full retail operation should they choose to do so, and not just as the firearms broker, which is essentially how they were approved when their business license first came in a couple of years ago. So uh, this is, this is, this, these changes could be part of the pathway of uh, addressing any, any, you know, technical concerns they may have about their business and how it's operating presently. Well, I, I, I think I, I understand that part. I mean, I think what we've done is fine. What I don't want to see us do is go out and see them tomorrow morning going, you can't operate anymore. Well, that's what we're trying not to not to do and by, by virtue of making some of these changes. Okay. I mean, what are we going to do with Mr. Garrett then in particular? I mean, are we going out there to, or is he coming in to visit you and start the process right away or after the council appro approves this. I, I'm just trying to make sure that we're not putting somebody out of business by adopting this ordinance today. Well, no, in our, in our estimation, we're, you know, by virtue of where they happen to be already located in an industrial zone, right. you know, we're, we're giving them a path to uh, become 100% compliant and be full retail and not have any of this ambiguity anymore. Okay. So this is something we needed to do for them and frankly for Mr. Dawson's business. Right. I just don't want to shut them down. That was my only concern, oh, yeah. is that we continue working with them, trying to get this thing resolved as quickly as we can. Yeah, no, that's, no, we agree, agree, and tonight's um, consideration is part of that. Would that, this doesn't go into a full effect then until the council approves it? Yeah, the council will have to approve the or, approve an ordinance. And but so we're going to start working with him immediately, is that? Well, yeah, no, if, if, you know, we will take it, we will likely go to our next council meeting and if we seem to get a positive read there on the changes, um, you know, they may be able to get somewhat of a, a head start on a, on a use permit application should they wish to become, you know, a f you know, completely retail operation with inventory and everything else at their present location in Southport Business Park. <coughs> and okay. I, I'm just trying to <coughs> verify that in my mind. Commissioner Guerrero, do you have any? I just appreciate the staff work and, and everybody working together um, as, as what's been accomplished here and uh, support, you know, the recommendation. I'll defer to Commissioner Austin. So taking into account um, what, what's been said, I, I 
My motion stands. I will make a motion to approve staff SAC recommendation. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Recommended action has been approved. Thank you. Any interested party may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission this matter to the City Council by filing a written appeal with the City Clerk within 15 days of tonight's action, and the appeal must be accompanied by the appropriate filing fee. Next up, we'll have the ratification of the Zoning Administrator's determination of the applicability of River Glen Estates tentative subdivision map. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a conflict with this, so I'm going to recuse myself. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Galvin. Good evening, Chairperson Perez and members of the Commission. This item is for the ratification of the Zoning Administrator's determination regarding applicability of the previously approved River Glens Estate <coughs> tentative subdivision map. In December 2006, the Planning Commission approved the River Glens map. Typically, tentative maps have a three-year life expectancy and expire if they are not approved. However, due to the economic downturn, the state legislature has approved a series of time extensions for tentative maps. Because of this, even though this map was approved over seven years ago, it is still able to be final. Also in 2009, the Planning Commission approved the Henniger parcel, parcel map, which is actually located on the same 10-acre parcel. The current property owner has requested reinstatement of the older 10-parcel lot, which has eight residential parcels, a rec corridor, and a drainage canal lot. The applicant has requested to formally abandon the four-lot map and reinstate the older map. The Planning Commission concurs with the Zoning Administrator's decision. Property owner decides at a later date that the 10-lot map is unworkable and wants to do four lots. Instead, a new tentative map would be required at that time. No changes are requested to the map as it has already been approved by the Planning Commission previously. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission ratify the Zoning Administrator's determination uh, and that all previous approved conditions uh, for the project remain in effect. Uh, this concludes staff's presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the property owner is also in the audience should you have any questions of her. Thank you. I'll start on my right. Commissioner Guerrero, do you have any questions for staff? No questions. Commissioner Moore? No. Commissioner Olson? Nothing. Uh, just want to make a comment, and the comment kind of stands with the other um, agenda item uh, that's related to rural residential. I do want to make sure that, that we start looking at that these as these issues arise with the general plan update, I, I want to you know kind of go through with a fine tooth comb. Um, the densities that we're looking at in Southport. Um, so as it stands, I'm, I'm happy to, to move staff recommendation, the consent item. Do we have a second? A motion for staff, motion. staff recommendation, yes. Do I have a second? Second the motion. Chair, uh, I'm sorry, we have to take public comment first. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, um, I'm sorry, I thought this was a consent agenda. Well, right. since since we didn't take it with the meeting uh, with the meeting minutes, um, and we heard it after a public hearing item, it's better to take public comment on this. Okay. Right. Do I have any requests to speak? Thank you. So I have no requests to speak. Do I have to open? Um, I will go ahead and close public comment. And may I request a roll call vote on this matter, please? Okay. Thank you. I will start to my right. Oh, okay. Austin? Uh, yes. Galvan? Olson? Yes. Liebig? Yes. Moore? Yes. Guerrero? Aye. And Perez? Yes. Thank you. Is 
Is there anything that needs to be read by staff for this? Yeah, that, any interested party may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission this matter by the city to the City Council by filing a written appeal within the City Clerk within 15 days tonight's action, and that appeal must be accompanied by the appropriate filing fee. Thank you. We'll move on to item number three under a regular agenda, which is the public hearing regarding Myers Ranch tentative subdivision map. Ma Madam Chair, uh, to be conservative, I need to recuse myself from item number three as I may have a conflict with this item. Thank you, Commissioner Liebig. So we allow uh, Commissioner Liebig to depart. Um, Senior Planner Sandra White will present this item. Good evening, Chairperson Perez and members of the Planning Commission. Evergreen Communities seeks approval of a tentative map to subdivide approximately 15.7 acres into 16 single-family lots. The project site is located east of Jefferson Boulevard and south of Perkins Avenue and is zoned rural residential agriculture. Get this light. Uh, 16, you won't be able to see the um, slides on that screen. There's some mechanical difficulties. You should be able to see on your, uh, each plan commissioner should be able to see it on your screen. Um, 16 individual lots overlay the site, which were created as part, not that, it should be the slide before that, Katie. Thank you, there you go. 16 individual uh, lots overlay that site, which were created as part of an old 1913 subdivision map. 15 of the lots are one acre in size, and one lot is point, uh, .7 acres. Next slide. The applicant uh, proposes to reconfigure the 16 existing lots to create 16.98 gross acre lots for the development of ranch, ranch yacht, ranch yacht type single family homes. All of the lots will be served by public water and sewer. The easement for the RD 900 ditch bisecting the project site and the section of the ditch located north of the site is proposed to be abandoned and filled and replaced with roadside ditches. Access to the project uh, will be via a new road from Jefferson Boulevard. A secondary road will be provided via French Avenue and Perkins Road. Next slide. A portion of the French Avenue right of way, which is highlighted in yellow, located within the project site is proposed to be abandoned and accom to accommodate the proposed project. The proposed abandonment includes that section of French Avenue located between the new subdivision road and the southerly boundaries of the project site. And as a result of the proposed abandonment, the remainder of the French Avenue right-of-way located uh, between the project, uh, project southerly boundaries and Blacker Road, which is located further south, will require a turnaround because it will exceed the allow allowable dead-end roadway length of 150 feet. The turnaround can be provided either on the site or off-site. The applicant is proposing an off-site cul-de-sac easement that would be constructed uh, when properties south of the project site are ready for development. In the event that the easement cannot be obtained uh, at, you know, when they're ready to final this map, uh, a turnaround will be provided on site and the applicant has provided an alternative lotting pattern showing the turnaround on the project site. Lastly, I want to speak to the proposed uh, lot sizes. Development in Southport is based on the average density um, uh, as opposed to minimum lot sizes. And in the RRA zone, the average density is one dwelling unit per acre or less. The average density proposed for this project is 1.02 units per acre, which for all intents and purposes is one unit, is equivalent to one unit to the acre. Uh, I want to also clarify the policy in the Southport framework plan regarding RR uh, zoned lots. Uh, when the plan was adopted in 1995, new subdivision maps in the RRA zone were allowed to propose interim development to either the rural estate or the agricultural density if existing sewer facilities were more than one air mile away. The RE zone allows one unit per 2.5 uh, acres and the A1 zone allows one unit per five acres. Interim development at either density 
allowed uh, private septic systems subject to approval uh, by the Yolo County Environmental Health Department. The policy uh, does allow processing of a parcel map, which is four acre, four unit, four lots or less, uh, to create one acre sites with the requirement that the lots would be allowed to, uh, would, would, would hook up to sewer when sewer is available. And in this instance, the applicant is proposing to provide public water and sewer for parcels that are slightly less than one acre. And under this scenario, staff feels that the uh, 0.98 gross acre lots will be compatible in the RRA zone in that each lot will be served by public water and sewer. The size of the lots would not negatively impact the character of the surrounding mm -hmm. area and the proposed density is consistent with the RRA zone density standards in the Southport Framework Plan. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission conduct a public hearing, certify that the Planning Commission has reviewed and considered the proposed mitigated negative declaration, and approves the mitigated negative declaration as presented by staff, and that the mitigated negative declaration reflects the independent judgment of the city as lead, ag lead agency under CEQA, approve the requested tentative subdivision map subject to the conditions and findings identified in the staff report and adopt the mitigation monitoring plan for the implementation of the adopted mitigation measures. This concludes my presentation and the applicant is uh, available in the audience as well. Thank you, Sandra. <coughs> um, before I open public hearing, do I have any, um, <coughs> do my commissioners have any questions for Sandra? I, I would like to make a comment and then maybe we can hear from the applicant. And what Sandra told you that if it's close to an acre, it's okay to be rural residential. We actually had people come before the planning commission from the beginning of planning commission that had smaller lots less than an acre to be qualified as rural residential. And they had to come before us and the lots existed and they'd be just like this, 0.98, nine-tenths of an acre <clears throat> and they were not allowed to be rural residential until we approved them <clears throat> and to be very honest with you I consider all these 0.98 acres large residential lots they are not rural residential lots and shouldn't be treated as such and so you shouldn't be able to have horses and things like that on it they're just large lots and if they wanted to make them rural residential that's not part of what they asked for in this staff report that I read. That's what you included tonight because I asked the question of David the other day. But as far as I know, we don't have something in our staffing or in the Southport plan that says if you have something less than one full acre that we can arbitrarily make it rural residential. It's just a residential lot. And that's what they have here. And I'd be interested not now, but after the applicant talks, and maybe we could talk about it just a little further at the end before we make our decision. Okay. Thank you. I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, I don't have any requests to speak, but if the applicant would like to come forward. Good evening, Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners. My name is Ken Topper with Evergreen Communities. I'm a Community Development Manager. Uh, our office is located at 1200 Melody Lane in Roseville, California. Additionally, I have Pat Hannafy and Tom Colleen from our office in attendance. In April of 2013, Evergreen Communities purchased 15.7 acres located on this site off of Jefferson with the intent of building 16 ranch ranchette-style homes on large lots. We began the process of review with the city staff in June of 2013. While the review process has been a little lengthier than we initially envisioned, we're very happy to have Myers Ranch before you tonight. We're very excited about the prospects of this new neighborhood. We even have a prospective buyer who has been tracking the project from its inception, and as of, this, as of literally this afternoon, is telling me which lot he wants to buy. So we're very excited about the potential of this project. We are prepared to begin improvement plans as soon as possible and would like to be breaking ground on this project in the next few months. We'd like to thank Stack staff for all their hard work in getting us to this point. We've reviewed the staff report and proposed conditions of approval and we are pleased to report that we are in complete agreement with staff's recommendations. We are in fact available for any questions and if Sandra wants me to try to address that uh, issue of the area of the lots, we can do that or, okay. 
Uh, what we proposed in this project, and one piece I think that might be missing from it, is there are existing parcels here. There are 16 existing parcels on the property. You'll note that I said 15.7 acres. In our minds, it's a 16-acre property. The reason for this is that the original parcels were created at one acres on the 1913 map. Uh, I think in 1952, I believe it was, or maybe 62, there was a section for the one house that exists where it was removed via a d grant deed, which took 0.3 acres out of the property. So technically, currently, we have 15 legal one-acre parcels today and 1.7-acre parcel, which is a legal parcel today. When we were working with staff initially, our comments to staff were, and we talked about this at length at the time, is it better to do 16 parcels and a 0.7 parcel, or is it better to spread that, disc, that, that space out and go to 0.98 and get toward uh, there being a parcel that's not significantly less than the acre? That's the genesis of how the 0.98 acres came into play. Um, we obviously could. We're trying to reconfigure to make a, a subdivision that works better for us. We could have left that 0.7 acres. We didn't like the idea of that. We actually left that up to staff to give us a recommendation as what they preferred. We preferred the 0.9 acres because we felt that that kept in keeping with the one acre lot size and staff concurred and that's why we went down that path. My comment was, I don't really care if they're 9.8 9 acres. It's just they're not gonna be horse property so you understand that that's my opinion it has to be one acre or larger to be horse property and I would defer to staff that, I mean yeah. the zone we are not proposing any kind of a zone change there okay you have any other questions or any of the commissioners have no okay thank, thank you. you I did re uh, receive a request to speak Linda Sprans I hope I said that right Good evening. My name is Linda Sprans. I'm a resident and property owner at 2605 Perkins Road, and I would like details about the fire road, um, what the improvements will be, and also if it will be locked off so that we don't have increased traffic on Perkins Road through French Road. Um, it was kind of scant on details in here about that, so I would like that clarified. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Perkins Road and um, Perkins Road and French Avenue are public roads, and um, the um, the secondary of the word will not be blocked off because they are public roads and they will be improved. Uh, to, to provide the secondary access for this project. This project would not work without there being a secondary access. So I couldn't tell you specifically what types of improvements there will be, but the engineering division can address that question for you. Good evening. Okay. Uh, as an offsite requirement, we've looked at minimum requirements necessary to provide for the emergency access primarily. It's not uh, intended to improve the road beyond its current condition or, or or character. Um, emergency access requires 20 feet of durable dust-free surface. Uh, we've inspected the road along with the fire department. Um, it needs to, what the plan is, is to scrape off all this material, fix the soft spots, and to do a one inch overlay of asphalt uh, for a 20 foot width. So there'll be no, no widening of the pavement. It's just uh, reconditioning to allow for uh, no delays in emergency response time. Should that, that should that be necessary okay so I'm I didn't have a chance to go to French Road or to Perkins but I noticed in the pictures that there was um, like a gravel on t at least that's what it looked like in the pictures so is that correct? it's it's a dilapidated paved road yeah it's it's, it's so um, there, there's been gravel placed in some of the soft spots um, okay. But primarily, it's a, it's an old paved road. Okay. But Mark, the main access is coming off of Jefferson. Correct. The main access that is coming off of all Jefferson. Paved and right. Okay. Yeah. We require for any road that's in excess of 600 feet that two points of access be pro provided. Okay. And so this. 
Do we have any commissioners have any questions for him? No. Okay. Thank you for your input. I have another request to speak from Sam Hayashi. Um, I live on 3090 uh, French Avenue, and um, we're actually on we're actually a private road right there um, on the portion that's coming up to this project area, and I, we actually have Porsches, and um, right now we don't. Um, there's an easement through our property to for facilitating access down the road, but um, and I think we're the last property on this entire stretch of French that hasn't given up that easement. So if we give up that easement, we'll be under the the, the acre to uh, have horses. So um, I'm not sure how that's addressed. Uh, we don't want to give up our horse property. Um, also. I was wondering about um, if there's ability to tie it into um, water and sewer from that that subdivision. Um, so you're possible. currently on well, um, septic. septic. Yeah. Um, and but mainly, I'm I'm more worried, and that is not a paved road. That is a gravel road, totally a gravel road. Right. There's no pavement. <laughs> um, on French. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. Was he talking referring to? Were you referring to Perkins? To Perkins. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that section. So we're we're kind of worried about um, just the inflow of traffic going down there. But it was one of the whole reasons we bought that property was because it was on a dead end gravel road. Don't really want to have um, people zooming past. I have a six month old and a three year old, and they play outside all the time. So uh, just worried about impacts of travel. Um, we were actually considering uh, trying to put a gate down uh, further down on French. Um, just to limit access, because uh, we have people coming down there all the time. Uh, so this would just totally destroy. <laughs> so it would be a thoroughfare at that point. So um, just interested in hearing about what uh, mitigations will be for traffic um, and also the horse property issue. OK, I'll, um, I'll look to staff to answer those questions. Are you, excuse, are you located south of Blacker Road? The canal. The canal, on the other side of the canal? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That section, I believe, is, is private. <laughs> the, the, uh, the area of French Avenue between Perkins and Blacker Road is public. That's a public road. And regarding, um, that, that, thank you. Uh, regarding, did you want to take, I'm sorry, sounds like you have another, oh, address. <clears throat> Go ahead and go. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, keeping of horses, the, uh, per the zoning ordinance, we have an animal ordinance and animal forgive me. We have an ordinance that, that would allow horses in the ag zones and rural zones regardless of the size. So if you have less than an acre, you can still have a horse. Yeah, our, basically, our animal, animal keeping standards don't animal apply in the rural, residential, rural estate, or agricultural general um, zoning districts. Okay. Sir. Okay, I have another request to speak, Mr. Yevkeny. Madam Chair, I just wanted to see if we can address the other questions that were raised by our last speaker. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Yevkeny. Um, can you have a seat for a second and I'll call you up in a minute? Sorry. Okay, um, Commissioner Guerrero. The, the question um, related to um, the, um, that this owner has a septic tank and was interested in tying in. What, what are the options for that? There will be a, a, a water line uh, that will loop around Perkins to going south down to French Avenue and also within the new subdivision road. So um, water will be available to those parcels if they, if they would like to hook up. Uh, sewer will only be provided along that new subdivision road. Okay. Yeah, the, the gentleman's property is actually located south of the canal. Um, which, is, which is at least a few lots away from this particular project. So mm -hmm. those improvements would not extend south of the Blacker Road Canal. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Oh, I see where he's at. Okay. Um, Mr. Yevkeny? 
Igeni. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm a neighbor with Sam. He lives in 3090, and I live in 3080. I just finally new house in 2012, and this is absolutely right. The the French road is a bright road, and it's a gravel road, and uh, I agree with everything what Sam told about the impact of traffic. And I want to add that you know some <clears throat> crazy drivers going there, like you know making a tour and whatever on our properties on his property on my neighbor property. And we are, we are looking to uh, place the gate somewhere close to Harmon. And my concern is question, what <coughs> is this road going to be through road, through the black channel? I've heard you're going to make some sort of bridge, walking bridge over that black channel connects on the French private portion to the... Right. To Actually, the they're talking about French Avenue on the other side, on the north side of Blacker Canal, correct? That is correct. So... Um, you're, you're probably not privy to the map and you we're having technical difficulties, but um, from Perkins Road where French Avenue connects, that's where it's going to go through to the new court. Or so as of right now, regarding this project, the, the Black Channel stays the same with connection intersection of the other. Correct. The, uh, so uh, you'll uh, still French remain um, yours and Mr. Hayashi's uh, property will still remain private. So there Excellent. won't be any connection to... Um, French Road. It's on the other side of the property, the north or the north side of Blacker Canal. Yeah. So yeah. you guys are safe. And basically talking <laughs> about the 0.7 acre for being the rural area. Well, I don't know how matter our decision is or uh, uh, opinions. We prefer to have a point, you know, 0.9 or one well, one, acre one acre lots and keep it a rural area. As I talked to uh, Mr. Dale a few years ago before I <coughs> built my new house, he said the city would like to <coughs> uh, keep that particular area being the rural uh, part in West Sacramento. Okay. And also, um, I don't know, it's <coughs> uh, in the conclusion, uh, my, my, neighbor, my neighbor Sam and another, another side <coughs> uh, neighborhood, they, they get these letters, um, you know, packages, but I never received it. Is that to the planning department, Dave, or it says Dave Tilly, Mr. Tilly, send you, me this letter, but I never received on my address. Okay. Is that the reason for that, or? If you were, you were notified if you were within 500 feet of the project. So if, if you were on the other right. side 30, of the block. 30, 70 is the, uh, with the 500 feet. 30, 30, 80 where I live, it's not a 500 feet. Okay. But 30, 90 where Sam lives, it's uh, with not, 500 feet, but he received it. My neighbor received it, but I never, I never received any correspondence. Okay. <laughs> and I run the business in West Sacramento as well, and all my addresses in the, should be in database. Okay. But I'm a little frustrated. Though. Okay, apologize for that. Oh, oversight. Maybe someone can, from planning department, uh, put my correct address in and send okay. me letters. Thanks so much. Thank you. <coughs> I have another um, request to speak from. Dale, I can't read your last name, I'm sorry. Stone, okay. I almost said Stein, so I wasn't sure. Mr. Stone. On 2950 French Road, I was told that that ditch across the front of our property was what everything's supposed to drain to. And then I talked about putting a pipeline in, and they said, no, I can't do that, because that's the drainage. And is that gonna <laughs> continually continue to be the drain for that property? Or are you guys gonna build that into your infrastructure? That the drainage ditch that's located um, along French Avenue, they're proposing to abandon that easement and to fill it and replace it with roadside ditches. And they're, they're proposing to um, uh, in, uh, construct um, an open ditch that will be located between, I don't know if you have copied this type report, between uh, two lots and then drainage will be conveyed from that open ditch south to the um, to the uh, existing ditch located south of the project. Right now mine drains from uh, French Road that's you know, right next to Perkins all the way to Blacker through that canal. So if you're going to take that out of there am I going to have some place for my property to drain? I'm sorry I couldn't hear you. Is my property going to drain some place properly then? Engineer. Yeah. Thank you. 
the plan that's shown on the tentative map actually picks up that drainage from the ditch, and we have coordinated with RD 900 on this, who manages the ditch. But uh, there's a condition of approval that says that they need to design their drainage system when they eliminate that ditch to accommodate all tributary area that's going into that ditch now. So the drainage study hasn't been done in entirety, but that is a condition of approval of the map that they accommodate your drainage and everything else that's going to that ditch. Okay, thank you. Chair Perez. Chair Perez, um, just as a reminder that the public should be directing their comments to the commission and perhaps any additional questions from the commission to staff can be addressed after the close of the public comment period. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stone? Mr. Stone? Mr. Stone, was that, was that the end of your questions? Okay. <laughs> okay, I don't have any other requests to speak, but I would like to, um, before I close the public hearing, I would like to bring back up Linda Sprans. All right, thank you um, for the city engineer for clarifying the road, um, that it will be asphalt and stay 20 feet wide. We like that. Um, one suggestion I have, and I don't know if this is the proper venue, but um, speed bumps, can, can we request that speed bumps be put in on that area? Perkins Road and, no? I don't, I don't think does, we have the authority. That, but that would go through traffic, but can we, can we note that we would appreciate that since this is certainly gonna change the character of Perkins Road and French Road that currently doesn't go through? Currently, we're on dead end areas, and progress is progress. That's fine, but we had a lot of construction last year from the school building their solar system. They were supposed to bring in all construction through the high school. Everybody came down Perkins Road, and it was just cars going up and down. Um, and I'm I'm also wondering if we can condition it that all construction goes through. Um, that when they do the construction that they use their main road and don't cut through. Um, so the new Perkins road the new road that they're putting in. Yes. Especially for big trucks. If it's gonna be a small road with one inch of asphalt, I think it's important that any construction use the um, road off of Jefferson. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other requests to speak, so I will close the public hearing. And I will def refer to staff as far as um, the questions that were, I think we a answered most of the questions. Yeah, I think that the issue of, of speed bumps, that's, that would be under the purview of the traffic division, which okay. is uh, in the public works department. Okay. They would make the determination as to whether or not, they look at several things, there, and there, that's under their purview uh, as to, to determine whether or not speed bumps would be appropriate. Okay. In that area. So I'll go to my commission. I'll start on my <coughs> left. Do they have any questions for staff? Commissioner Galvin? So Charlie has the history, and I'm curious, David, uh, has that been a hard and fast line on the one-acre lot? Or well, the, what's most critical here is density. Um, and the framework plan is about de is density is the controlling factor. It's not, minimal, it's not a minimum lot size. Um, there are numerous lots in the rural residential area, rural estate zone that are substandard. Um, there's a substandard lot, even part underlying lot in this particular area right now. So in our estimation, you know, this is a project where they have 16 lots that are legal lots of record in this area. They're essentially proposing to resubdivide those and we'll wind up with 16 lots again. So from a density standpoint, um, we're still at, you know, one unit per acre. Uh, which is the general plan and framework plan provision for the rural residential land use designation. Looking at the entire project. Correct. One, one year for yeah, um, another way, another example of how we can, you can look at this is um, like the prior project we considered, um, that was one where um, the lot sizes themselves were only one and a quarter acre, um, but the overall density remained um, you know, consistent with the framework plan because they did the clustering you know, concept. So the density is what's most critical here, not necessarily, you know, the, the lot size itself. 
by substandard you mean under one acre but uh, the density reaches one acre based on the project yeah so I'll, across the board here the lots you know we have 16 lots we're working with existing lots and then we're resubdividing those into another 16 lots so density is essentially is a wash so uh, on, the, on the lots that you re referenced that are already existing that are so are those also less than one acre? Are some of those uh, less than one acre? Well, and one of the lots that's in this particular project right now is uh, seven tenths of an acre. One of the existing lots, and that's that's just a legacy of at one time that w the county had this area actually at a half acre minimum um, for many years until a corporation and the framework plan. Okay, came I guess in. what I'm asking: are, are there any existing residences under one acre? Other than not the lots that are proposed, but are there any existing residences? In that Oh, there are, there is bound to be at least some homes on substandard lots in our in this area, without a doubt. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Yeah. Um, so two things. One is uh, I just want to make a request. Perhaps if, if staff could talk to um, Ms. Brands about. I don't know if she's already left, but uh, okay. If you could talk, perhaps you know later offline. I believe we have some contact information about how she can get in touch with the traffic department. That would no, be great. No, no, no. Um, I also I alluded to this in item number two. I, I'm, I'm concerned that maybe the way that we're approaching um, allowable densities is going to be continue to be problematic in Southport, and that's what I was kind of talking about with the general plan update. What, for me, what I would envision for Southport is some areas where we're going to see some increasing densities, and some areas that we want to preserve some of the the more rural, you know, horse owning, you know, ranchettes. And how do you preserve that? Because I'm, again, if you're seeing more density in Southport, that's going to in, uh, essentially increase the allowable densities in these rural residential areas. So I'm not concerned so much about this project. I'm, I'm more thinking about big picture, long term. I think that's something that we need to consider when we're looking at the general plan. So that's just a, a note that I want to make, and I'll be involved in, in the general plan update. Um, as far as this project goes, I'm, um, I actually had one additional question. So to confirm, the area between Perkins Road going down towards where the future um, Myers Court will be, French, is that intended to be a service and or emergency access road, or will that be a paved s street that people would, would, could use? So I need a little clarification on that. Yes, it is a public road. It will be open to traffic, and it'll be improved only to emergency standards, again, 20 foot wide within a, you know, just uh, evening out the rough spots, basically. Right, so it won't be necessarily a complete street, it won't have no. striping, no. curbs, et cetera? Correct. Okay. Um, and will the, will the paving, is that something that's being paid for through development impact fees, or is that's that something a, that's That's a project expense. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay. Commissioner Olson? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. Uh, I, I can appreciate what David and Sandra have told us about the lot size. And I, I just emphasize to you that, you know, this isn't an existing lot. They're kind of existing in the old fashioned way, but this is a proposal that they're making to you. If they change one lot in there, they'd have one acre parcels in there. And then I would have no qualms about this project at all. You'd have one lot. When you arbitrarily change all the lots to be substandard to what our requirements are, then we're just encouraging them to provide something that is less than what our ability to provide our community is. I'm not opposed to the project. I think the project's a great project, and I encourage you to come here. What I'm concerned about is that we're putting out a substandard product to our own community and we tell other people that you have to have one acre lots and I've listened to many people come in before us that go that's what my lot size is what do you want me to do and we've granted them the exception this is something that we're creating and if we're creating substandard lots I just don't think that's what we should do I think with just changing one lot you would have all standard lots so I don't mind approving the project. I just don't think they should be rural residential. I think they should just be large residential lots. That's the final comment. Commissioner Guerrero. Um, well, 
I think that's a very good question. Um, and I'm uh, curious to hear the answer to that question, if that's um, a question or something you're just putting out there as a comment. Well, I don't know. I think I've asked the question. I, the question's been asked, and I mean, David's telling me that it's okay to provide substandard lots in our community, and that's his opinion. I just don't think that we should do that as commissioners. I think we should abide by the fullest standard we could. If they're one-acre lots, they're one-acre lots. They want to propose something less than that. I think that's well within their right to do so. I just don't think they're going to be rural residential lots. I think they're going to then become a, just a large residential lot in our community. And to the gentleman's comment that said, if you take my access road, I'll have less than a full acre, that we would plan on that and we would say, well, we created that problem. And since we created the problem, we would grant them the right to have a rural residential lot. But I think when we create a rural residential lot less than our standards, we haven't done our job up here. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, in um, looking at the recommended action um, on page six, um, it says in addition to the state map act findings, the planning commission may wish to make additional findings specific to this request. And I just um, wanted to get some clarification. Is that, so that's a separate request that you're asking us to consider here? Or is it inclusive? Okay. And that would be beneficial as um, this project moves forward to make. Planning <coughs> Commission to consider. Well, that's it. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Guerrero. I'd just like to clarify for um, the two addresses on French Avenue 3090 and 3080 that we had a request to speak. Um, those are on the south end of, of the canal. Um, so those actually, they are on French Avenue, but they're not on the French Avenue that's going to be paved or the French Avenue in question um, but I would like to let staff know that um, the gentleman at 3080 French Avenue should have re re pardon Mr. Voshnikov thank you <laughs> like Smirnoff. Like Smirnoff. There, you, there you go that's a better <laughs> that's a better relation that I can get um, he should have received, if Mr. Hayashi received um, a notice in regards to this, he's actually closer than Mr. Hayashi. So that's, I uh, just want to make sure that in the future um, that that doesn't get overlooked again. And I apologize for you not receiving a notice. Um, I'd like to thank staff for this. Um, I don't have any other questions um, besides getting the ones answered by our request to speak. Um, I am a little concerned by what Charlie brought up as well. So I don't know how to, how to explain that better to him or to all of us. Okay. The Southport Framework Plan bases development on the average density. It does not dictate or prescribe minimum lot sizes. So based on that, um, we um, made a determination that the project would be consistent with the density prescribed for the RRA zone. They are reconfiguring the existing lots that overlay the site right now. They already have one substandard lot that David had mentioned is all already seven tenths of an acre. There are a number of properties in Southport that are zoned RRA that is substantially less than one acre. Um, and in addition, there was some concerns as to whether or not, you know, if it's less than an acre, it would not be horse property. And as we had mentioned earlier, 
the animal keeping ordinance does not apply to the ag zones and to the rural residential zones uh, and the rural estate zones. So regardless of the lot size in the ag zones and the rural zones, you can have horses. If you have half an acre, but you have the, the ag zones or your zone rural residential or rural estates, you can have a horse if it's substantially less than one acre. So uh, we don't feel that this would be, um, these would be substandard lots because they are 0.98 acres. They're gonna be served by public water and sewer. We feel that the, um, the proposed lots would be compatible and they are consistent with the average density that's allowed for the RRA zone as prescribed in the Southport Framework Plan. Thank you. Can I, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Just one quick question. In the additional um, uh, findings that the proposed H, that the proposed map is consistent with the Southport Framework plan, um, plan, yes. Does that help in addressing Commissioner Moore? Yes, it does, okay. So then maybe making this a d analysis. If we agree with the analysis, correct. Uh, if you don't. <laughs> There's a couple of us, I think one of us doesn't. I see. Well, no, I, 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 I do agree with the, um, with the plan. I see Charlie's point here because in his example, a singular person would not get to use the law of averages that we're doing with these 16. So I actually see Charlie's point on this. Can I, can I make a, another comment? So what I understand from the applicant was that the existing parcels, and Steph, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, the existing parcels were such that there were, I believe, 15 parcels that were within the one acre that we're looking at, and then one, one acre, acre when it was like a 0.7 acres. Oh. So so here's, here's what I'm thinking. Also, according to the applicant, they, um, under staff's guidance, recommendation, whatever, um, there was a recommendation to even it out. Is that, is that an accurate? They had, you know, there was an op, they, they had, they proposed to two, two alternatives and they could have went with either one. Their preference was what you're saying tonight. Mm -hmm. And so we were comfortable bringing this. Right. So what I'm gathering is, is two pieces. One is, as I, as I indicated earlier, what I suspect is that as we see increasing building, increasing densities, um, and when I say densities, I just mean, you know, quarter acre lots, that's, that's making the overall Southport area more mm -hmm. dense. Um, that's, a, that's a kind of standard single family lot size. Um, so what I imagine is that what was an acceptable density even five years ago is probably less dense than what's acceptable now under the framework. I personally am comfortable with staff's interpretation based on that just kind of intuitive interpretation. Um, and then I, I think that another alternative to look at is, all right, well, what about if we entertain an option of either um, the lots as described or these one acre lots with one 0.7 acre lot. If I had my druthers between those two options, I would prefer this average where you have a little less than one acre as opposed to having one kind of outlier. To me, that's functionally, <coughs> there's a big difference between 0.7 and one acre. Um, so it would be my preference as well to go with, with the lot as, as presented. And, but I do think that that's something that the, the commission could entertain is maybe looking at 15 one acre lots and one 0.7 acre lot. So I don't know if that's something that we want to discuss or consider. Great point. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's great. And what Jeremy just told you a minute ago is that's how we end up with, you know, we've ended up with parcels that are a little smaller than an acre, but they are rural residential, but that's what they've ended up with. They would not have the right to average the lots in. That's all I'm saying to you. I mean, if you like the project at 0.98, God bless you, go ahead and vote for it. You know, that's what you do. But all I was saying is, the way I understand a rural estate to be, it's supposed to be one acre. If it's not one acre, then we're granting something that's, you know, watch them all fall off their chairs over there in the staff level. We're probably granting some special privilege to a group, you know, that to allow them to go below one acre and still be rural, rural residential, I think. Now I think that. But I mean, do I like the project? I think the project's terrific. I think there's, every, there's so many positive points to the project. I just don't consider it to be rural residential when it's below one acre. I just think it's regular residential property. 
Which brings me to my other concern about, like I said, under the, the definition, let's say we continue to build out you know, another subdivision or some higher density row houses, suddenly you could build 0.75 acres and still be rural residential under the way this plan currently is. So that's what I'm saying is I, I encourage us to look at that. Maybe we need to set a one acre minimum because then that's in the general plan and rural residential will remain that, that rural feel to it and, and we'll you know, have this kind of, you know, preserving our ag style living so I think that's, that's what we've done yeah I think that I, I truly I thought that rural residential was one acre that was our ideal size for a rural as residential property is that right David well you know that that certainly has been you know the rule of thumb but the, the applicant and that's all I'm saying the application document here is the framework plan which is about density and so another project comes to mind it goes way back a ways but we did another map, um, the Hart property, way at the very south end of town. And that was in the ag zone where the general rule of thumb is five, you know, one, five acre lots. Well, 10 of those lots are four and a half acres and then there's one big 12 acre lot on the corner. And you know, that was a map that the commission approved many, many years ago, but it was sort of the same principles to where you know, the overall density met the general plan and framework plan standard, but each individual lot you know, they all averaged out, but you know, many of the lots were less than that sort of five acre threshold, but the, you know, on an average density across the board, it all met the test. And so this is a very similar, you know, similar situation here. And what we're talking about on a difference is 871 square feet, you know, per lot is the, the difference between 0.9 acres and one acre. And so, and I understand the concern about rural and what we have been concerned on looking on this one is also about the sort of the more rural vernacular, you know, that we're looking for in the rural core. And that's why we're gonna be very interested when the design review time rolls around, you know, to make sure that this, it does fit into that rural vernacular, um, not just with homes, but, you know, fencing and other things like that, because this is indeed a rural residential area. It will remain that way, even with the new general plan. Um, this area is sort of sacrosanct in that regard. and. This is the beginning of the rural core south of the high school, moving down further and further south. And so the, the rural vernacular that I think is, is, remains desirable in the community can be preserved even at you know, 98 hundredths of an acre you know, versus one acre because the, the overall density is still there at you know, one unit per acre. <clears throat> If my commissioners don't have any other questions or comments for staff, I would like to look for a recommendation or motion. So I don't, I don't have as much heartache with the interpretation of staff, but I understand what other folks do. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion uh, that we approve the item. Would your motion include the recommended additional condition in Ms. White's memo? It would. Okay. Thank you. And that includes the um, additional findings. Yeah. So, we, so we clarify your, your, are you moving the recommended action? I am moving the recommended okay. action. So with with the, the additional condition. With the additional condition. Okay. Second. I, Commissioner Guerrero, second. May I request a roll call vote? Chair yes. Perez. Thank you. Ferrero? Aye. Austin? Aye. Galvan? Aye. Olson? Aye. Liebig? Moore? No. Perez? Aye. Thank you. Any interested party may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission in this matter to City Council by following a written appeal with the city clerk within 10 days of tonight's action and the appeal must be accompanied by the appropriate filing fee. Okay. Um, so Chair Perez, if we, if we may, I would like to tell that we will cancel our next meeting on July 3rd. So I hope the commission all has a great 4th of July holiday and we will see you back here on July 17th. Thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I'll second. Great. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Somebody left something there? I think that's the fireman. 
Oh. We could talk to him. Just pick it up and say hi. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> Was that Brian's radio?